Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Monica Mercado. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at Bryn Mawr College, where I direct the Albert M. Greenfield Digital Center for the History of Women's Education. But I'm especially um, excited to get started to talk about faculty innovation um, in the liberal arts. Um, the panel is called Digital Learning, Blended Courses, Faculty Innovations, and Goals for Student Learning. Um, I will let this group mostly introduce themselves. <laughs> Um, but I've been given a little bit of information to share with all of you. Um, in this session, faculty members from across the disciplines will describe some of the ways in which they incorporate digital and blended learning components into their courses at Cuba College in upstate New York. Um, as someone who teaches and facilitates digital history at Bryn Mawr, I am especially excited for sessions like these that focus on small colleges and what we can do in our classroom. Um, and I'll quickly introduce uh, the four presentation titles now and then let you guys take it away. Um, digital learning at CUCA, understanding skills and dispositions will be presented by Nancy Marksbury, director of digital learning at CUCA, and Tim Sellers, a biologist by training and associate vice president for academic programs at CUCA. Nicholas Hoverstein, in, an instructor in child and family studies at CUCA, will share his ideas for incorporating cell phones into course learning activities. Um, so since I'm sitting under the clock, hopefully you'll forgive me for keeping time on my cell phone. <laughs> uh, Enid Bryan, Assistant Professor of Communication Studies, will speak to the power of social media in digitally inflected learning environments. And finally, Jenny Joyner will present on using GIS technologies in teaching fiction. Jenny is a division chair of the Division of the Humanities and Fine Arts and Associate Professor of English at Cuba. Um, so we have these four presentations. We have a full house. I know it's a little warm in here, and unfortunately, I don't think we can open the windows, but we're going to try to keep this door open and bring in more chairs if you attract uh, more presenters. Um, so I'll let you guys take it away. The paradox of the youth. Digital natives, they get everything. They do everything they've got all the tools, it's easy, they can blow us away. The paradox is, no. They can point and click, but they're really not there to get the power of digital tools, even starting at this age. I'm sure it's registered or not. <laughs> so we asked the question, how can we augment our students' passions for their programs, for their majors, their social work, history, biology? How can we augment that with digital skills, not only for learning effectively with digital tools now and in a lifetime, but also unleashing the power of those digital tools, going beyond the point and click, going to code and create. Our group uh, is a group of faculty. A group of faculty uh, and uh, staff that have been working on this and building this academic initiative for a little while. We call this Digital Learning at Cuba College, or DL at KC. The goal of this is to create graduates, every single one of our graduates, that are digital thinkers. Digital thinkers are critical thinkers who understand how digital tools work, both their limitations and their possibilities, in order to enhance problem solving and enhance creativity. This is a collection of curricula. It's a collection of pedagogies that should be comprehensive, that starts from the very beginning and continues until they walk across the stage with their diploma and setting them up for lifelong learning after that. It really is two parts, the curriculum and the pedagogy. So the pedagogy is learning with digital tools. Not only is this something that we want to enhance, but this is a skill that they're going to need more and more. So how do we train and effectively teach them to use their digital tools as they're learning. And the second part is, how do we teach them to leverage those tools? Again, when augmenting with their majors, their passion. So we're not creating a computer science degree. This is something that goes across the entire spectrum for all our students. Now, when I say all of our students, we're kind of a complicated college. And I know that's what everybody says. We're all, we're all complicated. We have a, about 1,000 students face-to-face traditional age, 18 to 22-ish. We also have about 1,000 students across New York State 
where we do our accelerated studies for adults. We call it our ASAP program, where we teach primarily in blended or hybrid uh, modalities. And finally, we offer about, about 3,500 students across China and Vietnam, where they stay there, and they get a, a joint uh, diploma from their home university in China, Vietnam, and from Hooker College. So we have a very diverse group of students in, all across the world. How do we pull all this stuff together? Well, we're starting. We need some of your help. So look at the pedagogy side briefly. What's that effective and appropriate use of digital tools? You saw that the definition a moment ago of, of digital thinkers, knowing the limitations and the possibilities. We are certainly not about getting everybody iPad and say, we're done. It's when does this work, when does it not work, and then how do we use it? We're going to put that into a face-to-face -face environment, put this into blended and hybrid environments, and even into our, what we think is online. So it's not the use of tools, but how to use them. So for example, quick tangent there, our online, we offer actually very few online courses, but this is something that we want to do more and more. However, our clientele, our students, they appreciate the high touch environment. So what we want to create is a developmental process where we are going to teach them to learn effectively online, because we all know that's a really, it's a very difficult thing. So instead of throwing it in there, how can we use our time face to face to de help them develop into effective online learners, which in most cases they're going to have to be for professional uh, accreditations, all sorts of things for the rest of their lives. And then finally, how can we actually utilize our campus, whether it's our campus itself, uh, right next to Cuca Lake, one of the best lakes in the world. <laughs> Perhaps in the world box. The lake biologist myself. How can we use the campuses across New York State for adults, and how can we use the campuses in China and Vietnam and other countries where, where we're working? In third spaces, so that first space is a classroom, that second space is the residence hall, where they're going to live. The third space is the rest of the campus. Can we give them the skills, the understanding, the dispositions to utilize this so learning is a 24-hour process, not just when I go to class? The curricular side of this. What we've already done is we've created a minor. This is our additive. Any student can take this digital studies minor. It's composed of six different courses. We start off with looking at digital communication. We move into uh, basic coding, systems thinking. Then we go into storytelling, whether that's quantitative data analysis or whether that's humanities-based storytelling in a digital environment. And finally, we, uh, 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 we end up with a capstone minor course where they can take and solve problems in their major utilizing the skills and disposition. So that's already underway. Where we're working on now is actually the integrative side. How do we integrate all of these things into the majors themselves so they're not adding, but it's infused? To do this, we've created a group of student learning outcomes, these SLOs, that we will start using our digital action groups. A digital action group is a group of faculty in a program, students from that program, digital learning experts, and finally, it, taking advantage of one of our hallmark, our, our biggest hallmark, the experiential learning, and we have internships for every one of our students every year they are there. Every year, a thousand students go out, they go into the real world, they do a month-long internship, they come back. Four times, four different experiences. So if we bring some of those employers or those nonprofit groups back in to be part of these digital action groups, not only can we say, what are those skills that they're going to need, but we're also setting up what are those problems that our graduates are going to be able to solve. We can enhance our curricular, uh, we can update, and it makes everything work a little better. When we infuse this, we're going to infuse this across our programs. So the social work faculty will have a digital action group, and they're going to look at these student learning outcomes, these pretty broad-based learning outcomes, and say, what resonates with the social work faculty? What resonates with the problems in the social work? That's going to be a different set of actual, actionable items than what the biologists come up with or what the historians come up with. So we invite faculty to say, what does it make sense? These guides are going to be there, but what actually comes out, what manifests, is going to be particular to those programs. We're also looking at a digital action group in our gen ed. What are those base skills that we can put in in the gen ed program? This field period program that I talked about, that's our internship, we call it a field period. And even the co-curricular, 
So we've got about 60 clubs and campuses across the, uh, the campus. And they all have to do certain things to maintain club status to get monies. How can we take certain digital skills and make those requirements for every club to be in? So it's the curricular and the co-curricular that work together. Again, all this goes back from these student learning outcomes. And what I put up here is uh, something you should have in your hands right now. It's a group of seven SLOs, very broad based, that these digital action groups will take and then start creating curriculum around. Whether that's new courses, learning modules, what have you. So when we look at creativity and innovation, where students can learn to be those critical problem solvers, models, simulations in a lot of different environments, communication and collaboration, how do we learn across distances? What are the fundamental good and bad parts? What are the research and information fluencies that our students are going to have to be able to master? The critical thinking, problem solving, and decision making. So from a digital tool standpoint, how do we make those digital thinkers? What's digital citizenship look like? What's the dark side of all of this? What are the ethical concerns that are going to have to go along, both from a basic standpoint and in their passion in their program? Technology operations and concepts. What's coding going to be? Coding will look very different in the humanities base than it would in biology and in social work and in these other things. How will that work? And finally, like all good ones, we put a critical reflection and evaluation. How, do they, how are they going to use their digital tools to become better reflective learners? Now, this is an overview. Everybody you're going to see in a minute is going to be touching on different components of these and giving you real world examples of how this is happening in our curriculum. And then finally, we're going to have a, a wrap up session where we're going to ask you some questions and say, what are we missing? <laughs> what are we doing well? What are we not doing so well? So, that's my spiel. And I'd like to uh, bring up Dr. Laurel Hester, biologist, and take over. So, um, at Cupid College, our uh, learning management system is Moodle. Some of you may be familiar with this. Others may be using Blackboard or um, another learning management um, system. And most of my uh, brief discussion here is going to focus, this kind of comes from my experience teaching human biology, which is a uh, general education course in our curriculum. And it uh, is taught both on campus in a traditional format, but also in the Accelerated um, Studies for Adults program, where it is taught in a hybrid format, actually, with most of the content um, kind of online through, our, through Moodle, uh, but with some on-campus uh, lab experiences for those students. And um, so really, it was in updating the hybrid course to um, more closely matched the, the course as I uh, was teaching it on campus. Um, it really forced me to be a little bit more, um, I think, intentional in my thoughts about, for my on-campus course, what should be online um, and uh, what should be in person. And so um, really thinking about how, even on, in my on-campus course, how can that really be a hybrid course as well, where uh, I can really use the learning management um, system as an online tool um, to kind of leverage the learning to meet my course kind of discipline objectives and to increase student time on task. And um, I think this is especially a challenge, so in an on majors course, you have students in there who um, you know, may not be the most likely to, you know, hit the book studying for that course um, after class and, you know, really get into reading about human biology. So um, the more that you can scaffold kind of that process for them to get them to spend more time on task, the more um, they can feel confident in their mastery of the subject information. Uh, and so this starts um, from the very beginning, actually both in the hybrid course and in my traditional course, actually with even a syllabus quiz to get the students to show that they really know what those learning objectives even are at the beginning of the course. And um, interestingly, as I try to be more intentional about how can I use the digital tools to meet my discipline objectives, um, you know, I found more and more I was meeting some of these kind of digital learning objectives as well that we have been working on um, uh, developing. And um, 
So, of course, probably most of us do use learning management um, uh, systems to access course resources. Uh, and um, one of the things that can be really interesting when you uh, look at the actual students uh, accessing it, and the course I teach, uh, Human Biology, uh, on campus it's about 40 students. I, I'm just showing um, about a dozen uh, student responses here. But one thing that was really interesting to me is that they will go online and uh, these are ungraded here, practice multiple choice questions before each exam. And so although they have some weekly quizzes, some students will actually go online and practice these ungraded multiple questions a lot. And that seems to um, kind of capture their interest a little bit more than you know, reading through the textbook or their notes. Uh, and so as a comparison here in a non-major class, my, while I did post my genetics lecture PowerPoints, actually no one accessed it. <laughs> Interestingly, this is a little bit different in my majors courses. I find that my course PowerPoints are accessed much more often um, by those major students who tend to be a little bit more motivated. Um, but of course, even better, uh, you can get the students to be involved in finding the resources, and this is where they really start to develop those digital skills. And so before each exam, for example, I have an assignment where just for actually very few points, but um, where they have to post to a study forum a link that they found that will help their classmates study the information, um, and they have to say why they think that link would be useful. So this is really getting them the skills, and again, this is a gen ed course on a very basic level of going out and finding the information themselves, the information that um, works for them. And so um, they're getting practice, getting information, even if it's you know, just YouTube videos. Um, but some of these students who are social workers, of course, where, you know, when they graduate, they will be going to the web to find information. And the more you do that practice, the more you feel confident in that. Uh, and so here's just an example of one of the students um, posting there. They found a video on somatic cell nuclear transplantation. Um, they like having the visual aid. And, um, and interestingly, even though students are not required to post comments on these assignments, often they will, and I think that's very rewarding for students as well if they post something and people comment on how useful it was. Um, so uh, to kind of, and interestingly, another assignment that I initially developed more for the hybrid class, but then uh, really decided to use on campus as well, um, was to get a little further than just finding the links, but to get into evaluating the links a little bit. Um, and for this assignment, so like one of the requirements is that they're supposed to um, choose a topic and uh, find three links on that topic. Two should be from reliable sources, and so we talk about you know dot com sources or are not being necessarily as reliable. Um, and of course, there's no hard and fast rules there about what's reliable or not. But you know, a YouTube video in general may have great information, but may not be as reliable. I actually will allow one of those three links to be a YouTube video because there's good stuff out there. Um, and um, so here, they you see them start to make some of those first forays. I think into really thinking about um, you know what is the purpose of this site. And so here's an example of somebody who was. Um, doing their topic on Parkinson's disease. And, you know, so they're including here, well, it functions more like a website for people who have or are concerned about the disease. It includes links to upcoming events covering the disease. So thinking a little bit more about what's the function of this website. And um, this is a assignment where I do require students to um, com to comment on a certain number of those and to include in their comment enough specifics so that I know they've actually read. And so here, um, you know, this is somebody who's bringing up kind of a misconception that they had about Parkinson's disease um, that they didn't know that about symptoms other than shaky hands and limbs. And it's interesting that it has to do more with the mind. And I found that actually by, you know, my kind of staying out of this and having these comments, um, you know, I get to see students for a, a little bit more, again, into building that confidence both into finding the resources and then uh, using them and deciding what's going to 
uh, work for them and not. And so these are really starting to hit on some of these digital learning objectives as well as really the discipline objectives that I have um, in my course. Um, and so I want to kind of finish up just showing this is a graph of um, student accesses over the course of the semester. It's right now, way up right before final exam. <laughs> these, uh, these numbers are kind of funny numbers. I, uh, the readout from Moodle, I think, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what it's um, measuring. And of course, some of this access is going to be um, looking at their grades, um, although the peaks uh, do seem to be actually right before the exams more than <laughs> right after. I, I checked on that. Um, and uh, so here we're seeing the posts, and here are the views. Um, but again, matching with those numbers on the first slide, students really are using these resources, and they like the ones that are a little bit more interactive. And I think one of the biggest things is just this has allowed them to spend more time on task with the material but also getting practice searching through the internet and thinking about some of the information and deciding for themselves what information is good and you know, what information is uh, less reliable. So even in kind of what's mostly a traditional course, um, you know, I've found that you know, I can really use the learning management system not as an add-on, but really as an integral part of the course and an integral part of the working with the human biology information. Um, and so now I'm going to pass to um, Anid Bryant, who teaches a whole course, um, which is much more focused on getting students to go deeper into evaluating some of the digital resources that are out there. Okay, so my name is Anid Bryant. I'm Assistant Professor of Communications at uh, Cuba College. And um, we all know that we live in a society where students use their digital gadgets. It's their norm, right? It's their, that is typical for them. So for us as instructors and professors to spend class time focusing on trying to teach them to use these tools, it seems pretty counterproductive. Instead, in my course, I focus on why those tools work and what happens when they don't. Um, so that's a little bit of what I want to focus on today. The course um, that I'm going to be talking about is a course called Understanding Digital Communication. And it's a newly developed course. It's been offered three times now. Every time, you know, there's a new iteration of it. But the course is a foundational course in the minor that you heard Tim talk about earlier. Um, the really interesting thing about the course is that it really forces students to think about their digital consumption. Um, and so one of the first things we talk about is trying to ensure that they become critical consumers and producers of digital communication. Um, one of the ways that I do that in the course is we talk about uh, the tools that they use every day. Uh, but we go beyond the mundane emojis and status updates and instead talk about the power of that tool in their hands. One way to do that is through case studies of what's going on in the world around them. And a really popular uh, social media phenomenon that we saw was the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. <laughs> so we all know about this, the challenge, right? Um, at this point now, the ALS has raised more than $100 million in donations, and they're not even promoting it anymore. Um, but it, it still continues to trickle in, and money still continues to come in. The interesting thing about this challenge is that ALS didn't pay a dollar to put this thing together, right? People were their public relations, you know, boots on the ground, and they were able to, you know, average citizens like you and I were able to use a smartphone, you know, a tool we all have with a video camera, and uh, YouTube, which we all have access to, and essentially we were able to make real change in society um, through this social media phenomenon. Now, that's not to say that they did get a little bit of pushback, right? So here is where we talk about that not all digital communication is good, right? There is there is, there are some constraints when it comes to digital communication. So it was interesting with the ALS campaign. Um, there was a new term that was sort of coined and used in mainstream media. Um, this idea of slacktivism, right? So I can watch what's going on in the world and good things are happening, and I'm passively a part of that, and that's okay. And so there were there were some interesting uh, dialogues about. Uh, 
uh, is this really effective? Is this viral, trendy uh, philanthropy really working? And so these are the kind of case studies that we've been able to explore in the class and really talk about social media, you know, mobile phones, um, YouTube, in a way that is um, forcing them to not just think about these tools, but how, how powerful they can be. And so I ask this question, you know, digital tools are amazing because we reach a massive audience, but does our message become diluted over time? And, you know, you can talk about the dress, right? What color did you see? <laughs> but, you know, over time, you know, do we forget? Um, and so, uh, so that's a really interesting, uh, interesting discussion that we've had in class. And it also makes us think about um, the challenges that these kind of case studies can bring up, bring to light. Um, and how they're viewed uh, by other audiences. And so the rhetorical choices in these kinds of multimodal communications are really important to discuss as well in the class. And again, that brings us out of just passively consuming this information and thinking about it critically, you know, from a more analytical perspective. So they come into class saying, oh yeah, digital communication, that sounds great, social media, but we force them to become critical thinkers throughout the process as well. So interestingly enough, um, uh, uh, Focus of the course is on Twitter, and um, again, I don't, I don't think that um, I can teach them to use Twitter. But what I can do is I can show them the power of these digital tools. For instance, we talk about uh, the ALS I saw the challenge and how effective that was, and we talk about Twitter and how everyone is on it. It's the fastest growing public uh, uh, social networking medium. Uh, at, at the same time. These tools have the power to threaten, you know, intimidate, terrorize communities. Um, so we, you know, we we talk about how ISIS, for instance, you know, has a very strong um, stronghold on this type of social media. This is how they recruit. This is how they uh, fundraise. Um, so you know, that's a scary thing. At the same time, it's a double-edged sword because it's also how the U.S. has been able to target in on some of these ISIS leadership, uh, ISIS leaders, and find out where they are so we can, so the U.S. can actually um, target military action. So it really is interesting and um, about the double-edged sword because it, everything you do on the internet is trackable and traceable. And this in itself is a lesson for them um, to understand that nothing is anonymous. Yik yak? Yeah, right, it's supposed to be anonymous, anonymous, right? That's why that's the big appeal on college campuses. No one knows what I'm posting about that professor or about that person, you know, and it's led to cyberbullying. And it's also led to um, some campuses totally uh, blocking it. Um, and so uh, this is another one of those social mediums that you know, has been used to threaten, terrorize, and bully. Um, and so we talk about how these tools are so powerful but is there a way that we can use them to harness social change, right? I mean, look at the power it has. I mean, it has the power to scare people, intimidate people. Um, you know, there have been really sad stories about what young people will do because they've been bullied on these sites. And so we, we, you know, we question if it has so much power in that sense, can, can it then change the world, right? We looked at and then the ALS, I saw the challenge being an example of that. The affordances and constraints. So, um, you'll hear a lot today about the good and the bad uh, of, of uh, digital communication. Um, and so one of the things that uh, I focus on is not is moving beyond those cliche examples of make sure you clean up your Facebook page, make sure there's no pictures of you drinking on your Facebook page, or you know don't say mean things on, your, on Twitter. But it, it's really more than that. It, it's focusing on um, understanding the information out there and reading the information more critically. So uh, one of the things that Tim talked about was creating digital uh, good digital citizens. And uh, that idea is really interesting because we all know about terms and conditions. And, you know, the thing you have is the little checkbox, right, in order to use any kind of digital communication device or tool today, you have to agree to terms and conditions. Now, the interesting thing is no one ever reads those things, right? They're like 300 page documents. They're a tiny little text, right? And you, you, but you have to agree to it in order to participate. So you agree to it. In, uh, in my class, one of the really interesting assignments that we've done is um, I've pulled some terms and conditions from various organizations. We've deconstructed those and compared the content within these documents. And it's great because I just sit back and watch, and the students actually realize how much information is in there and that these policies are not made to protect us, right? These policies are made to basically uh, take advantage of us 
And they don't understand that until you know they sit down and have this aha moment. For instance, one example was Game Station. It's a gaming store out of the United Kingdom. And in their, one of their clauses, they actually, you, if you agree to their terms and conditions, you sold your soul to them. <laughs> 7,500 people sold their soul okay, to this organization. Now, they really didn't want, they weren't in the business of collecting souls. <laughs> they, just, they just wanted to make a point. No one is reading these documents. And so if for students, it was one of those moments where they said, oh my gosh, what am I agreeing to? Instagram was another great example because they're very active users of Instagram. They didn't realize that any photo they posted to Instagram no longer was their property, right? And that photo could be used in any way, shape, or form that Instagram wanted. And so that really forced them to stop and say, what am I agreeing to when I go online, right? I need to be a little more uh, conscientious about the activities that, I take, that take place on those digital devices. It may seem very benign, but when I put that check mark, you know, what's coming out of it? So these are the kind of things that we're studying in the course, and um, I thought that was a great example. Lastly, you know, we don't just talk about effective digital communication, we also get our hands dirty. And so, you know, the students may sort of blog throughout the semester about digital communication. We keep our conversations going in the Twitter sphere, you know, that has a hashtag for the course. And in addition to that, I try to focus on demystifying coding. Um, when they hear about HTML and coding, they become very anxious and nervous. Um, but we really try to introduce to them the language. And so we do some simple you know, video games as well as website development. And it really sets the stage for the next course in the minor. Um, but more importantly, it all circles back to that original statement I made to all of you, which is I'm not trying to teach them how to use the tool necessarily, but to understand why they work. Right? So what does the back end look like? Because the idea behind it is that they're going to have these tools on them anytime. They're all day long, they're always going to have these tools on them. So the idea is to take these tools and create my own policy and practice and procedure around them so that they, uh, we can guide their future behaviors and, and make them more critical to so, uh, so on that note, I'll just switch over to uh, my colleague to make this So to kind of jump off from where I need left off, uh, we need to start creating policies and procedures in order to start adopting some of these digital technologies. And one of the real scourges of the academic classroom happens to be cell phones. Um, and a lot of people have policies on cell phones. A lot of people have policies where I don't want you to use it, which uh, doesn't always work out. And some people have policies of go ahead and take your time and use it and come right back to me. What I want us to start moving towards is really owning that in our classrooms and setting up policies in which we are using them. So we become the mechanism to start kind of controlling and guiding this digital technology and utilizing it in a way that it enriches our classrooms. Now, cell phone ownership is at an all-time high. It's probably at a point in which we're not gonna get any higher. Um, almost everybody's adopted cell phones, right? I'm sure most of you have one in your pocket or on your desk or in your hand right now. Um, we know that there's two major camps of cell phones. We have the Android crowd, Right? and the Apple crowd, and they're gonna kind of do a beat it type dance against each other and go back and forth, and we have this big infight of what you want to adopt on your own. We know that students identify with their cell phones. In fact, their cell phones, like McLuhan said, is really an extension of themselves. They live through their cell phones. They're using Yik Yak, they're using Twitter, they're using Instagram, they're emailing through their cell phones, they're using it to call and to text. This literally is their method of communication. And it's something we haven't quite tapped into in our classrooms yet. How do we really use this successfully? We don't really need to train our students. They're using this every day. In fact, they're using it so autonomously that sending a text messaging class might not actually be a distraction at all. They're doing it so readily and so easily that they're just pre-programmed to start hitting those buttons. So we really don't have to put a tremendous amount of footwork in on this. This is what we see as ownership, and this was done at, a, at the University of Connecticut in uh, my past life there. And this is actually a poll that we took on students and what they were owning. Now this data is about two years old right now. Um, so we don't see it gonna kind of going up very much. We're at about 91% of cell phone ownership, with the vast majority falling into owning some type of iPhone or Android device, and a very, very small percentage still having a traditional mobile phone. 
Now this is something we need to be aware of if we're going to use it in class. We want to know what our students have, we want to know what the technology is so that we can utilize it appropriately and so we're not leaving students out. Uh, we don't want to start using an app in our classroom per se if we are not sure whether each student's going to be able to utilize it because we're going to be leaving somebody out. So you could if you want say, you know Nicholas, I don't believe what you're saying, I don't want to do it. And that's cool. And that's fine. We all have our strategies. But if you're not going to use it, you got to figure out how to ban it. And you can be fairly effective in banning it, right? I've seen instructors come in with one of those over the closet shoe bags and each student has their name and they put their cell phone in it when they walk in the door or they put a bowl in the front of the room and they stack it. We were talking at dinner last night about putting your phone in the middle of the table first person to touch their phone pays, right? <laughs> so there's all these different ways. However, I'm gonna tell you what, those students are gonna be going through withdrawal. And that could in fact be much more distractive than just letting them have it in their pocket. Ever left home without your watch? You feel kind of naked. You sit there looking at your wrist, hoping and wishing to see those two hands. It's not necessarily distraction free. What happens if one rings and you gotta go through and go get up, right? And what do you do in the case of an emergency? Um, I, don't, I don't see a phone in here. So what do you do? So these are some reasons why you might want to ban it, but I'm going to tell you, you'd be much better at using it. Okay? So we're talking about the best method to control. If you want to clip a pattern, you have to start a new pattern. And if you want to control, you have to be ready to leave. And that's where we're going with this idea of utilizing cell phones in the classroom. We're talking about leading students to utilize probably the strongest piece of technology that they're always wearing around on them and using it in an academic fashion in the classroom so they're using it academically out of the classroom. Using the kind of policies and procedures that we're creating in class to then bring them out into the real world and have them use it in a very pro-social manner. So you have to get a little bit creative to do this. And creativity comes with a certain amount of risk. So you have to be able to be jumping into this. You have to be ready for it, and you, you have to try. You don't need to overuse it. We don't need to use our cell phones every day, but that's fine. If we're creating the pattern, our students are ready to use it. So they're not necessarily going to be testing as much, because that's going to get in the way of them being able to carry out that activity that you're doing. And I'm going to bring up some as we go. You have to make students aware that you're going to be using cell phones. Um, the worst thing is to have everybody scrambling in class and not to have everybody prepared. So announce it. In fact, announce it at the beginning of the semester. Do a small poll. Make sure you know exactly what they're using um, so that you can start orienting yourself. Even prior to the semester, we all have class rosters. Shoot an email out, right, with a small link. Have them answer a Google Docs survey of what they're using so that you can try to adopt um, policies and procedures that align with what they have. So poll everywhere is my favorite way to do this. Um, poll everywhere is basically a polling system online and it utilizes mobile devices to send a short um, SMS text message to a computer in which then you go and you create a poll. The poll is going to come up directly on the screen. You'll see a word cloud, you'll start seeing answers come in. And so it's a great way to start introducing a new idea. I teach in child and family studies, and as such, we have a lot of opinionated topics. What I really, really dislike in discussions, and mostly we're having discussions, is when I ask a question and people are hesitant to answer because they're not aware of whether or not they're going to be accepted. Take something like spanking, for instance. I can't ask my students to raise their hand if they've been spanked. I can't ask my students straight out saying, who agrees with spanking and who does not? They're going to be searching around the room and judging each other, and that is not what I want to introduce in my classroom. So this gives me a way to get deep into their minds, for them to understand that baseline and start understanding that people are different than them. And they start have, they kind of have to ease into conversation and get some of that depth and understand what the room is like so that then they can start having meaningful conversation with all of that baseline out of the way. That way, instead of talking about who's spanking who, we can talk about what spanking is, what the process, what the mechanism behind it is. Are there pitfalls to it? Is it an effective 
um, kind of disciplinary strategy. So we can get much deeper into conversation much quicker. And I don't know about you, but a 55 minute class period in discussion can go by lightning fast sometimes. And there's things you really wanted to get to, but you never really got past the introductory things. Poll everywhere can be absolutely anonymous. So in the case of talking about some of these edgy type topics, you want it to be anonymous. Your students don't want to be identified to you, and sometimes you don't want to have that kind of information on your students either, right? <laughs> so this is a way for them to kind of have that anonymity. The other thing is that you have different layouts. We can make this completely gradable. Just because it's anonymous doesn't mean it can't not be anonymous. You can have your students sign up for an account. That account will then be branded with their mobile device number, they'll put their name in, and you can literally grade things that they're doing in Poll Everywhere. So this is a way for you to use it similar like what a classroom response clicker would be like. You can have pop quizzes, you can be embedding pop quizzes into your PowerPoints or whatever digital technology you're using to try to transmit that information. You can even have them take quizzes at home going through a PowerPoint and when they hit that ticket and collect those polls. So it's a really good way to then extend the classroom and start taking it out of the classroom and, and getting information from there and still having that reach to your students without having to have that physical proximity. The other thing is Poll Everywhere is free. Well, it's free with a little cadet, right? Um, it is a technology, so it is free up to 40 responses per poll you have. So you can ask one question and have 40 students fill it out and it's completely free to you. Above that, you have to pay a licensing fee and I'm not quite aware of what they are because I'm cheap and I use the free version, right? But this again is one of those technologies that we already have at our disposal that's very, very easy. Bottom level integration of digital technology, something students have already, something that we can start using in the classroom to get much, much more depth, to actually start activating learning, to get them to learn from each other as well. Other things you can do is just get creative. Think about anything. Think way outside the box and give it a go. Evernote's a really, really good way to get cross-collaboration between your students, whether it's study for exam, Evernote functions as a single depository where they can scan in, take pictures of notes, start sharing those between their classmates. It's a really, really easy way to get students caught up if, for heaven's sake, they miss a class for some reason. It's also a way that you can get them to start collaborating on group projects while you're able to have some feeling of oversight. So you can have them put group minutes up. And again, it's that extension of the classroom. That idea that you can collaborate with them while they're not sitting in front of you. So outside of those three hours a week, you still have that idea of what they're doing. You can still guide them, you can still mentor them. Instagram is also a pretty cool thing to do. Um, think about being a theorist, right? And we all have theories in our various different disciplines. How important is that context? knowing when they started, what was the era in which that theory was being designed. Instagram functions as a way where you can give students that pictorial image of what that context was like. Pretend you're Freud. Go out there. Create a picture library of what Sigmund Freud would have up on Instagram. If he was living right now, what would he be looking at? Now, you're all probably imagining pictures of your mothers, and that's OK. <laughs> that's exactly what we want. But it's just that way, again, to start getting some depth, some richness into what we're teaching. But it's really hard to teach and explain context. You have to live it. Quotathons is a really, really fun thing. And this is something you probably do through Twitter. You could do it through email. You could do it on forum posts. It's really, really good for people in literature. Pick your favorite author. Let's start quoting back and forth. Think about a first year experience course where students are struggling with motivation. How do we start exchanging quotes with each other? Have them hashtag it with your specific class. Have them lift the spirit and start getting that connection and start using these devices to enrich each other. So it's kind of the opposite of cyberbullying, right? <laughs> it's cyber inspiration, right? And if you've ever gone to a CrossFit website, you know exactly what I mean. The last thing I'll talk about has to do with research races and one minute video challenges. So most Apple phones and Android phones and even some of the kind of non-camp phones have the capability of getting online and have the capability of taking a picture or taking a small bit of video. So this is something that you would do over, say, a week of class time. 
You would literally set your students up in groups and have them take their mobile phones out, their computer if they have them, and have them race for research. Give separate topics, give the same topic, and have them literally go at it. Start pulling research from wherever you are. Walk around that room and directly influence how they're searching for information, what the information is, and where it's coming from. So this is a way for you to take some of those outside research skills, or we would say write a research paper, and do it in class with your oversight. Again, that idea of having them get this source evaluation, have them understand that kind of literacy of what's going on, and how to look up a real peer-reviewed source, which is what we're all dreaming of, right? Mm -hmm. That one paper that has all peer-reviewed sources that all go together, even with contrarian views, right? Have them do it in class. Next day, have them come in and say, okay, you have to put together a one-minute video. A one-minute video. You have one minute, right? The dreaded conference elevator talk. <laughs> you have one minute to get your idea across. One minute to find somebody and collaborate to make a video. And you have the tool right there in your pocket. You have your iPhone. You have the ability to start clipping video. You have the ability to save and merge video files. All in the regular software that Apple gives you. And I have an old phone. <laughs> So this is another really, really great way for them to have a piece of something that they have from class that's not paper, it's easy to understand, it's jazzy, it's cool, it's a video of them explaining a research hypothesis that they did in the classroom. Something that normally we would assign out of the classroom in say a three week project and having them do it with some type of speed and using that and having that transfer into their daily life. If you can put a one minute video together in class, when it's time to do a three minute video, you're like, I got this. And all of a sudden you're taking your classroom and you're starting to enrich what's gonna happen in other classrooms as well. So these are philosophies. These are overarching ideas that you using it in your class will start influencing how students can use it in their other classes and start bringing your students' lexicon of what digital technology is to a higher place. With that being said, I will bring Jenny Joyner up. Hi, I'm Jenny Joyner. I'm a literature professor, and I'm also a Faulkner scholar. If anybody is a, is a fan of Faulkner and hears really long sentences. Um, and I need to give you just a little bit of background because I want to talk about what I'm doing as a scholar and how I'm bringing that in. And so William Faulkner in 1936, he drew a map of his county, Yakimataka. And he put on this map various places of people from his fiction. He's got um, 13 novels and about 63 short stories. So these are just a few things. So I'm working on a project right now. It's called the Digital um, Yakimataka Project. And it comes out, it's an NEH grant um, supported project and it's from the University of Virginia. And what we're doing is we are taking that map and this is the project itself, and this is the video that walks you through. It takes the map, and what we've done is we have mapped characters, location, and events. And this walks people through, so you can actually see where the action is taking place. The purple is where action is happening. This is a really fun story where there's a mule that's being chased by people, so you start seeing some circular patterns happening here. He's being chased right now. Um, and then you can also play in chronological order. If any of you know Faulkner, a lot of his stuff goes back and forth in time. So you can play in being chronological order. You can play in terms of <laughs> pages. This is something that's open to the public. You can go check this out online. It's really cool. But in doing this, my whole way of reading has changed. I was a really good reader, which is why I was invited on the project. I'm an amazing reader now because I have to take narrative and turn it into data. And that's a really interesting process. I thought it was going to be a piece of cake. I had learned a lot from it. And so what I wanted to do was figure out how I could take what I'm doing here and what I'm learning and bring it into the classroom. And so I was, I was teaching a American literature course last year. And basically what I did was I was trying to think about how do I blend these ideas together. Take the ideas that Nick was talking about, traditional, a thesis-driven paper, right, literature, supported by evidence, textual evidence.
But what I did is I had students, I requested that they have a thesis driven project. And this was a thesis, so I'm going to walk you through a project right now. So um, some of you may know Richard Wright's novel, Day of Sun. This is a, just a, a short synopsis. A young black boy is hired by a white family to be their daughter's chauffeur. He takes her home because she gets drunk. Um, the mother walks in. He's afraid of being caught in the room. He kills her accidentally and then he gets rid of the body and then he's chased around Chicago. And so this was the thesis that students came up with, that he's a rat. And this is a something that you'll see that is illustrated by overlapping lines. <coughs> What I had students do was go to Google Maps. It's a free platform. It's free. Um, it's open to everybody. It's not hard to use. It took me about 10 minutes to figure out how to do it. You can put things on the map, and I'll take you through some of the features that worked. So what happened, and I, I wasn't sure, this was an experiment, would this work? And it worked amazingly well because students then had to give this as a presentation. So it wasn't a paper, but they came in and they presented it to the rest of the class. And so it became that both producers, all of a sudden they were the producers of a project that all of a sudden people are looking at and asking the questions. It became this interactive process where they created something really interesting here, but there's a lot of questions that go along with it, right? And so it's something that all of a sudden they're getting interaction with. And so um, a couple of things to point out here. This is an overview of the whole project. And what they did was, here's a vent over here that they decided to map. They had to make choices. So there's a lot of critical thinking that goes along with that. They worked in groups of three. And one of the things for me as a Faulkner scholar is I usually sit down and I come to my interpretation. My project is also collaborative. <laughs> and you can imagine trying to get a lot of Faulkner scholars to agree. Um, for our mapping project. It's, it creates some really useful conversations, though. The same way it created some really useful conversations for students. So basically, uh, what this is, is this is Chicago. My students are from upstate New York. Some of them have been to Chicago. Some of them haven't. This is also, also it's interdisciplinary. Students don't know how to map. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but they get out their phones that tell them when to turn right and when to turn left. They haven't ever looked at a map. I mean, I know that sounds crazy, but they do in my classes because I'm all about mapping. But um, so they had to look at a map, and all of a sudden, um, one of the questions that students always ask with regard to this novel is why does a figure just leave the city? Why does he just leave? So one of the things what students did here is um, when when bigger is being hunted, the cops start going from this, they, they create perimeters. And over here is the stockyards. Now one of the disadvantages of using Google Maps in this way is because the novel takes place in 1940. This is 2015 math, right? <laughs> so there, that's a, a huge problem. But students had to go research this. The novel actually does give street names. So they had to go research this, and they were trying to figure out where is this perimeter. And all of a sudden, they were like, oh, there's a whole bunch of stockyards over here in the 1940s. So it became a historical project, too, where they had to research. They had to figure out why were these boundaries there. And they started playing with them. They also realized that, you know, this lake over here creates a pretty big boundary. <laughs> because they, at first, they were saying, why is it there? You cops over on this side. Why aren't they coming this way? Well, you know, this kind of stops. You, can, you can't really swim across the, the, the lake. <laughs> um, so this became really informative for students to look at. So this is a little bit more up close. Um, students can also be creative. They have, they made, according to their thesis, they called him the rat. There's a, there's a scene at the beginning of the novel where, where there's a rat who's trapped in a room. And so they were saying that there was a, some, um, a metaphor that was being used um, at the beginning later, <laughs> I call him the rat. So they gave him the symbolism of the rat. This is, is our different locations, places where they're, they're eating in the novel. Um, and of course, one of the other things, when a character goes from one place to another, they don't go in straight lines, right? And so this is one of the disadvantages of using Google Maps as well. Uh, but they can see that it keeps going back and forth in time. 
Um, you can also do layers. <coughs> Excuse me. And so what students did is there's three books in the novel. So they could do this book by book. So this was just the movement in the first book. And then what you saw earlier, <coughs> this was all three books. Um, they can also embed pictures. So one of the things that was really interesting to them is this is where the search perimeter, this is where most of the novel takes place. The police station is in a completely different part of town. And so all of a sudden they were like, oh, that's really interesting. And actually I was talking to students yesterday to get them to refresh my memory. And they found this more interesting because of more classes that they've taken since then. And so the discussion continued. But they can embed pictures. Um, students didn't know um, there's different locations where they went and looked what did this place look like in 1940? And they can embed those photos in there. So it becomes really interactive. And, whoops, um, sorry, I went too far. One of the things, students love this project. I had several students who said, I learned more from this than anything else. It wasn't a traditional paper, but they learned the same skills. They had to present it. They loved it. They kept saying, you know, this is the most amazing thing we've ever done. I learned more from this. They did learn some of the reading skills that I learned working on the project. They got to be creative. They had fun doing this. Um, they spent hours on this. Now, there were some students who did, didn't spend that much time, and they were OK. But there were some students who did some really amazing projects. This was a really amazing project that they did. Um, for the most part, they loved it. I thought it was much more useful in many ways than a paper. I, that the thesis coming out of it, because I always say to students, write your paper and then figure out what your thesis is, rather than trying to figure out what your thesis is and force it. Students couldn't make their thesis until they did their math. So it really reinforced that idea of let me look at the evidence before coming to a conclusion. So it was a really useful project, and it was a great way of bringing in geography, history, information literacy. Um, they had to do research, and they really enjoyed it. And it's free. It's a free platform. So with that, I'll turn it over to Doug and Nancy. Or if they have some questions. Can I ask you first to give our faculty a hand? Oh. <laughs> so uh, just to sort of recap, um, we see this as very much a bottom-up uh, organic process that is rising from the faculty in the classroom as it occurs and uh, we're grateful for that. Um, I think that we can operationalize digital learning in, uh, by answering three questions. Um, the where, the how, and the why. So where is ha happening inside the classroom and outside the classroom. Um, how we're using today's technology that is exposing students to what they'll uh, find when they land it in the workplace, and how, uh, sorry, the why, we're helping students expand their innate capacity for problem solving and creativity. So most of you, I hope, have in front of you the list of seven um, Digital student learning outcomes, digital learning outcomes. Um, and, and as Tim mentioned at the front side, we've been working on this for a couple of years. We've been, what you have in front of you is deliberately numbered the 1.0 version on the anticipation that we'll quickly get to a 1.5 and then a 2.0. That, in other words, it's an in process um, um, effort to try to identify a set of um, student learning outcomes that are related to creating digital learners, creating reflective, intentional digital learners. Um, what we would like to do in the time that's remaining is two things, actually. On the one hand, we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to ask the presenters if you have any particular questions of them. Um, and then if we have any time remaining after that, we would like to ask you a question about um, what your list of knowledge, skills, and dispositions that characterize reflective digital learners would consist of. What things maybe are we um, not including on the list? What more broadly, if you had to define what a reflective intentional digital learner was, 
what would be on that list. Um, we, we've made the first effort, and I guess the last thing I'd mention there is we didn't want this notion of digital learners to be an add-on to our notion of what students should be able to do, not least because our colleagues would have been very upset with us. What are you taking away if you're adding something to this? So it was our intention, and you'll see that in the structure, it was our intention to infuse and integrate the notion of digital literacy or digital learning into an already existing set of uh, capacities that expect the students to have. So again, first we would like to give you an opportunity to ask questions of the presenters. If you have it. Yes, I actually have a question of you both. If your administrators oversee this, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, half and half. Okay. I have faculty rank. I am the person who has been coordinating the digital studies minor. I was the chair of the humanities and fine arts division, and we created that digital studies minor within our division. Happily, I passed off to Jenny Joyner the duties of being the chair of the division now, and I'll be passing off also, I think, the, the duties of being coordinator of the minor. But I've, I'm one of the people who was involved in the early um, work that's being done, and I'm continuing to do that. So I'm faculty member. It's, it's because um, it seems like you've done something rather miraculous, that you've kind of created a, an initiative across your college and curriculum that people are buying into. Um, that's a work in progress. Like <laughs> Maybe I'm just imagining these things, but well, it seems no. like there has to be some administrative buy-in and financial Support? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the evil administrator. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, the administrative buy-in was actually, we were very fortunate to have um, some visionary leadership from our administration and board, which asked the faculty to focus on this and to think about ways in which digital learning could show up in the curriculum. And so that we had relatively little trouble with. And then the, the work in progress is always, you're, I'm sure there's a lot of faculty members out there, and you understand the issue is to, to develop faculty buy-in. And I, thought, I think we've made real progress in that, particularly over the last year. And I'm, I'm, you know, again, the folks that you saw me presented uh, are good examples of you know, getting that in, uh, excuse, harnessing, as Nancy said, harnessing what people are actually doing and creating maps of that. And, and then transforming that. Does that answer your question? Pretty much. I mean, it just seems like there's buy-in from both sides of us, the administrative and the faculty, yes. um, and, and perhaps also two areas of structure. My my my, commute, my computer area at my college is extremely old school, very unintegrated in some ways. But we have wonderful librarians who are getting marvelously trained up in ed tech and. We have great conflict, actually, in my place, um, in part because those two are not working so well together. I'm optimistic going forward with that matter. Yeah. We're delighted to It seems like you really have something rather unique going on. We are hoping that we hope things should. And, and again, that's what we brought Nancy on board as the director of digital learning to help kind of organize and focus mm -hmm. an ongoing project. And we were very fortunate to have her become sort of the the, the person who tries to help coordinate and herd the cats. <laughs> and if she needs help, as all we do um, about herding cats. Yes. And did you provide any workshops for faculty to be trained on various uh, technology tools? And how did it work? We've over, again, I'm going to try to jump in because Nancy's just joined us in, um, within the last several months. So, um, we have created a series of workshops over time. Digital Learning Day. And the faculty retreat. In yes. The okay, so we've had a digital learning day through the EdTech function um, over the past few years. And, and I think what the big part is we, by looking at these learning outcomes, looking at our existing technology, and this, the formation of these program or major specific digital action groups, it gives us a way to map our current landscape of faculty training and knowledge and find gaps and be very targeted going forward and putting strategies in place to do that. So it's an ongoing process. So you must have had a very good plan in place because from what I'm seeing, you have got perfect uh, course goals and also you used, you must have provided good training for faculty 
to use the, the, the digital tools to achieve these goals. Laurel, did you? Yeah, I was just so we also have within each division somebody identified as a technology learning mentor who is supposed to be a point person for faculty questions within that division, and those people that have on and off got you know gotten together to share ideas as well, and sometimes to communicate with IT about what they're kind of from the faculty and what are our needs or um, you know wishes, yeah. We've been very strategic in, in not only looking at the, um, the the faculty and the digital action group, so we get that more organic, um, bottom-up approach, uh, but also being very targeted when we are hiring and putting together our IT department. Uh, we put together, we have a new, uh, a relatively new CIO, uh, Chief Information Officer, who runs our, our IT department, and when we were hiring, this was something that was uh, on our process to say you have to be part of this team, and so we're looking. We get that strategic technology side as well as the ed tech as well as the faculty. Yes. Um, I have a question for the sort of things that Nicholas and Jenny are doing in the classrooms and what Anise is talking about because I sometimes feel a little bit skittish about bringing my students into some of these platforms when I know I'm not devoting time to talking about terms of service and what this means. Bryn Mawr, you know, less, has its own sort of WordPress platform or things like that, but I guess I wonder if you navigate that at all in terms of using Google or Instagram or the tooling things, um, because it struck me because, I mean, we sort of brought that up as something in communication that is important for our students to think about as, you know, digitally savvy mm -hmm. future consumers. We're also consuming things in a way that we use them. Well, for, for my project, I, I suggested that they use Google Maps because it was easy. Mm -hmm. and, and literally, it took me a few minutes to figure out how. And they took it to a whole different level than I was able to. And I told them, if you have a different tool that is useful to you, you can use that instead. But it, these are the kind of the things they had to use. Um, one student did actually, they could purchase an upgraded version for like $25, and one student did it, and then came back and said, don't do it. It wasn't worth it. Um, and that wasn't something I required. She just decided she was, she was going to be an overachiever, and it didn't really work out for her. But that was really useful for me to learn. Um, and so I didn't really worry about the tool. And I told them, I'm not an expert on this. It's something that I want you to play in. It's your new sandbox. Go try it out. And I think when I also show my project and show them that I'm playing too and that this is something. And I think students kind of like that idea of they can take control of it and they're going to teach me. And that if I'm willing to explore and maybe fail and say, I don't know if this assignment's going to work, this is what we're going to do, they're willing to try things out sometimes with me. And that's the advantage of being at QCA. We have small classrooms. Um, I know my students pretty well. And so that is really a helpful aspect of it. But they were willing to try it out and, and play. And that's exactly what I was looking for them to do. A lot of this tends to be fun. So the buy-in on their side yeah. tends to be greater than you might get with a, with a pen and paper assignment. Um, as to um, the terms and conditions, a, a lot of it is just making sure that you have an app. Uh, making sure that you have some way to accommodate them if they're worried. Um, so in the case of Instagram, you can cut and paste them into a Word document. You're not going to have as much fun with it. I'm not going to have as much fun with it, but, that, but that's okay. Um, and sometimes it's having them create a unique uh, username that's really just for classroom purposes. Mm -hmm. um, that way I don't have to see pictures of them on the weekend, because mm -hmm. um, I'm really not interested in that at all. Um, or even have a different Twitter handle that they use for academic purposes. Similar to the way that some of us brand ourselves, starting to teach them how to brand themselves and, and what those implications would be as a kind of a need brought up in, in her talk. This is a question over here. Um, my question is about the tension between, um, I mean, we all know how exciting it is to incorporate new tools into the classroom and how students get very excited about that. But I find that there's this inherent tension between adopting these new tools and making sure that we have a real pedagogical purpose for them and trying to figure out, you know, which comes first, right? The cool tool or the pedagogical problem we're trying to solve. So how do you balance that? You want to, anybody want to try that? Because I'm actually playing with that too. We're all really interested yeah. in this one. Okay, so Tim and, and oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Laurel and then Tim. I was going to say from the, the outset, we really put digital learning in two things. How do we uh, use technology appropriately and effectively? 
We don't teach to the test, so we don't teach to any particular technology. We have to take that sandbox approach. And it, it, it starts out with the content. Is this a good forum? Is this tool actually going to meet what we want to do or not? You know, my example, like getting everybody at has is, is absolutely meaningless and antithesis to what we're trying to do. So we start with that, the content in mind. Yeah. And I, I think you hit on a part, you know, that really making the choice is the difficult and the important step. And uh, it's nice that we do have the freedom here to really think about for our courses, what are our objectives, and then think about which tools are going to serve those objectives best, rather than feeling like we have to go down the entire list in every course and hit these things, even if they don't mesh well with what our objectives are for that course. Can I add to Because I, I also teach digital design. And one of the things that I've really found interesting is that, you know, everyone thinks the industry standard is the Adobe Creative Suite, right, when you're teaching digital design. Well, nowadays, with the, you know, there are, there are so many open source software opportunities that I don't find it as necessary to teach them how to use InDesign or teach them how to use Photoshop. The fundamentals aren't in the tools, it's in design principles, right? And if you could design something and follow the design principles, then you can use any tool to do that, you know? And so it, it, it is the, the, the fundamentals first. And then if you find the right tool to, to amplify that. I, I was interested just to follow up quickly and then we want to get another question. Because I'm actually working on a special project this or have been this past semester about creating blended learning versions of face-to-face um, -face courses. And of course, this is exactly the thing that I was having to focus on because I was intentionally, not incidentally, trying to infuse some of this stuff. And I think the great advantage I had was this whole notion of a set of seven digital learning outcomes. So I could include in my um, cor course list of outcomes, uh, one of the outcomes being, you're going to learn how to do X. Now, these were under development when I created my syllabus in the, in the spring. But now when I do it again in the fall, I'm going to actually key it to, to these and say, one of the goals of Kuka is to begin to, to develop the set of learning outcomes. So however you do it, if you can sort of create a sort of baseline of digital learning outcomes or some equivalent to that, it creates a, a reference point and allows to say, because you need to know these skills in order to operate in the rest of your lives. We have time so there was more questions. <laughs> so, so I was interested, I mean, I, I, I sort of imagine that the structure of your college is a thousand on-campus students and then a thousand students, you know, kind of coming in from other places, sort of forces programs and courses to be developed to a certain extent with some of these tools in mind, right, which is something, but I, I and then, and then there's sort of a chance then to take those technologies, the things that you've learned and apply them to face-to-face -face instruction as well, which I think for some of us, there isn't anything driving faculty to do that in the same way. So if you have advice for how you work for, for the faculty who are only teaching face-to-face -face and how it is that you're kind of selling people on employing this stuff where it's useful. I think the thing that is selling our, our colleagues at the school the most is that when we can say, this is what I did, and, and that helps. I mean, we need concrete examples. And, and you can imagine some of the younger faculty are the people who are doing some of these more innovative things. And it is some of the older faculty who are more recent to the same. Mm, that's not real comfortable. But then it becomes, and to say, you have to do it digitally would be intimidating. But if they can see how it's more organic, it's the organicness that we're making, we're doing the same thing. There's still a thesis for me. It's still, there's still a thesis here. But here's, we're, we're evidencing it in different ways and showing that it's organic and it doesn't take away and distract. Because if, I think if, if administration comes in and says, you have to do this, it's not going to happen. But we have to have those examples, and it has to be something that's coming up from the faculty organically. You know, peer to peer is the only seem to me viable way, sustainable way to do this. You have to do it in a way where you're getting peers to suggest that this might be a good idea, and, and as it's opposed a work, to administration. We have the workshop that some of um, others and then, and then a, a solid support structure, I think, as, as well for under construction. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's really helpful. And finding the time and the space for 
faculty peers to interact and share those ideas is the other challenge. Yeah. yeah. I think my own use came out of the, my own review process of my own teaching. And I was looking at ways in which I was having trouble. Uh, one of them was with students paying attention or motivation or the idea of being able to push yourself. Um, we call it intellectual risk taking. The idea of moving beyond your conjecture and getting into hypothesis and being able to take that step. And what I was finding was that a lot of it I was just saying, here, here you go, go, go fly the nest. I, I hope you figure it out. <laughs> Where I was finding I really needed to find a way that I could speed processing up so that I could follow what they were doing, guide them and, and mentor them a little bit. And technology was the necessity that allowed me to take things at that speed um, where I could do it in the classroom and see what they're doing and make sure that when they're going for, say, search results, what's your keyword? How are you setting the keyword up? And some of those minute things that sometimes we expect to learn elsewhere, but in your own specific discipline, have a little tweak to it or something that you learned along the way that you can help them with. And there's not a lot of classroom time for that always. So technology almost gives you a speed to get to some of your content so you can open up to some of the mentoring. We have a timekeeper who wants to make sure we stay on time and I all get lunch. I would just say, um, as in closing, we'll be here for the next day and a half or so. We would love to have conversations with you. We would also like to hear from you. We didn't get to, to yeah. that quite yet, but we'd love to be able to have conversations about how to, um, how to engineer this, uh, what we think is an exciting initiative. Thank you. Thank you.